Hi everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Community Re um, Industry Report AMA. My name is Anne Marie Pollocky Dinkle. I'm the event manager for CMX. Before I get started, I'll take you through a little bit of housekeeping and then I'll turn it over to our team. So first we have the welcome, which is happening right now. Welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you. Um, then we'll go into a little introduction. We'll give a background on the report. We will show you how it's grown over the last year. Um, then we'll do the community industry report overview with a real time AMA. Yes, something new. We're going to take some breaks after key insights so you can ask any questions you have immediately because I do have the problem too where sometimes things slip my mind. Um, so we want to make sure that we get everything accounted for and answered. We'll then break out into two breakout rooms hosted by the team um, here will have some intimate discussions, do a couple more deep dives and really just hash it out with each other. We'll come back for a wrap up and then that's it. The event will end. Some guidelines for today. Um, please use the session chat tab to chat with fellow attendees and leave any comments you have. This is just going to make it easier for us to you know, view the chat and all the emojis and all the good stuff coming up. Um, if you have questions specific to the AMA, uh, to the report itself, excuse me, please ask those questions using the Q&A tab, which is one over from the uh, one over to the right for the sessions tab. Upvote any questions you want asked. This is going to be very important. We have the wonderful Beth McIntyre here today who is going to be um, reading the questions out and facilitating the discussion. So the more votes a question gets, the higher up it'll move on to the list. Close any distracting applications. Pro tip, Bevy Virtual works best in Chrome. Some other notes, this event is recorded. So have no worries here. Well, this will be available for everyone to view. Um, questions that are not answered. Those will be collected and answered in a blog post following this event. We want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to receive some answers today. There will be opportunities, like I said before, to answer questions in real time, figure that this is the best way to host an AMA. So we're doing it. Um, after the overview, we will be breaking out into discussion groups. Um, which is highly encouraged for you all to participate in. Attendees have the opportunity to actually get on screen, like I said, and have face-to-face -face discussions with the CMX team. If you do not feel comfortable doing that, no worries at all. You can just listen in and um, kind of watch the discussion unfold. All right, our speakers. This is, this is our team, the CMX team. We've got David Spinks, founder of CMX. We all know him. Mary Cass, the senior content manager for CMX. She's spearheaded this wonderful report. And of course, Beth McIntyre, head of our community here. Everyone, please join me in welcoming our team. Is everyone good? Oops. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. All right, you all, take it away. Woohoo! Woo. How's everybody doing Thanks, out everybody. there? What an intro. Wow. I hope everyone's uh, <laughs> doing their standing ovation right now. Yash Raj, great, great suggestion. Everyone at CMX Summit, every speaker gets a standing ovation. So listen, we're all working from home a lot. It's good to stand up and stretch. If it happens to be for a standing applause for us, that, that's cool. All right. Nope. <laughs> Try again. Let's, Let's get these see. Here. Um, is this the right slide? There we go. Mm, is it We're seeing too it. small? It no. It okay. Great. Okay, cool. Okay, awesome. so welcome everyone to the uh, Community Industry Report walkthrough and AMA. 
Um, I think David and I will just kind of kick off by just a general introduction to the report. So this is building off research that began in 2017. So we've actually got the opportunity to compare our findings over the years. We'll be highlighting throughout how some of these stats have changed. Um, and of course, we did the last big version of this report last year in 2020. Yeah, so yeah, this this report's been kind of a staple of CMX for a long time now. Um, and it's it's been really fascinating to watch how it's just become this kind of like touch point that we have regularly to see how the industry is evolving, to see how things are growing, to see how things are moving and, and, and how teams are growing, how um, investment in community, how perceptions of community is growing. And so uh, we're really excited about the reports every year. This year seems like it was an exceptionally interesting time to gather this data because there's been so much of this narrative around like more businesses are investing in community and everyone's bought into community right now. It's really hot and really buzzy, um, but there, there really isn't a ton of data in this space. Um, there are some really great reports out there um, that uh, other firms publish as well, but there's still like just an ocean of data that could be gathered and more insights that could be gathered in this space. And so this is kind of like our big premier report where we'll be doing more reports throughout the year. Uh, but this is kind of like the, the high level, big picture of the industry. Where are we at? Where are we growing? Where, what challenges does our industry face and where are there opportunities to continue to, um, to improve how we do this work and get buy-in for community. And just like a quick shout out to Mary, because, you know, we've been doing this report for many years and I have to say, I think this year was like the highest quality report we've done. Uh, the, the insights are, are really, really interesting and, and that's intentional. That, that took a ton of work to really design our survey and design the report and really find the things that are gonna be most useful to this industry. And that was all thanks to Mary's guidance and hard work on this. She put, you know, months of work into getting this report together and just really excited to get it out into the world, so. Great work, oh, Mary. Thank you. And I, I would like to also give a big thank you to the CMX community and everyone that filled out the survey. We couldn't have done it without all of you. You can see we had 528 responses, which is great. The more people that help us, the better our findings are. So thanks to all of you as well. Um, if you've been through the report, these key takeaways should look familiar. We won't dig into all of this right now because we'll kind of unpack it as we go, but um, just highlight a couple really quick top line stories that we're going to talk about. For me, one of the most exciting things that we saw was that this investment and momentum for community continued throughout COVID-19. Um, we heard a lot of anecdotal evidence that companies were kind of leaning on communities more during the pandemic, but it was great to kind of see our data back that up and prove that out to be true. And we'll get more into that later. David, I don't know if there's anything off the top that you want to highlight that really stands out to you. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things is just seeing how teams are growing, right? So, um, you know, 88% of companies have at least one community manager. We're going to be diving more into the, the data around teams and how they've grown. But I've always kind of seen that as a really good representation of how this industry is growing because you can say you're investing in community, but unless you're actually building a community team, putting headcount behind it, putting resources behind it, we know community teams are historically understaffed and under-resourced. So seeing the growth of community teams, I think that it was 73% in 2017 uh, had at least one community manager. And across the board, we saw more companies with teams of two or more. We saw more teams with uh, companies with teams of um, I think it was like eight or more. So we're going to dive into this data, but across the board, teams are growing, investment is growing. Um, you can see here like 86% agree community is critical to their company's mission. So we're seeing that investment, we're seeing that buy-in, um, and we have the data to prove that now. So uh, it's clear that this industry is growing and businesses are becoming more bought into community. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I wanted to share Max's quote. I think it's really great and emphasizes sort of some of these high level trends that we're seeing. Um, our goal for this report and for this walkthrough is to make sure that all of you have the data as well as the inspiration and um, 
the strategy that you need to be able to kind of take advantage of this momentum and make sure that your community becomes an indispensable part of your company throughout the next year. I want to remind everyone as more people join us, um, just keep asking questions. We want this to be interactive. We want to hear from you. You know, if you want to go deeper on data and we don't have that insight yet, we'll tell you we don't have it yet, but we can tell you if we'll be able to go and find out and, and get back to you with more insights afterward. So um, keep keep posting your questions. And as a reminder, afterward, we're going to like open these rooms up so we can all kind of have a more open discussion and you'll be able to actually turn on your video and audio in those breakouts and, and share what you're seeing, what you're learning and what you got from the research. So um, please participate in this event. You don't have to just sit there and listen. Uh, so I think it's a, yes. Beth, remind I me. think it's important just to start by laying out where this data comes from and who it comes from. So again, we had 528 community professionals. Um, anyone that responded to our survey that didn't have a community or wasn't planning to launch a community um, in their company wasn't included in the report. So it really is focused on people that are managing communities as part of their job. We wanted to make sure these findings were really comprehensive. I think we've captured a pretty strong cross section of the industry. Um, so as you can see here, we've got a pretty wide variety in industries. We've got a range of titles, company sizes. We also had participants from all over the world fill out the survey. Uh, a bulk of that was North America, but we definitely have a spread across other regions as well. These are our top 10 countries. And we also asked what type of communities um, our respondents were hosting. So communities of customers were by far the most popular, but we did have a range of community types here as well. So ultimately, we hope that these findings will be applicable to you and they'll be able to speak to you no matter what your community looks like. We've tried to capture a, a pretty wide cross section and not focus on any one type of community more than others. Um, and finally, just on demographics, an interesting question that we didn't ask in the past, but our data does show that nearly two thirds of community professionals are female. So this is Again, the first time that we've asked these demographic questions, um, but this, this was interesting just to sort of lay a baseline. So let's dive into our key takeaways. We'll start by going through the good news, and there's a lot of good news this year, as David said. Um, Overall, communities in our study are continuing to grow and they're continuing to mature. So they've been in their companies longer, they're getting older. Um, this is great because if, if these communities are staying part of a company's strategy over the long term, it means that the company is finding value from that community. It's continuing to find value and, and stay relevant and they're continuing to invest in that. Uh, 62 percent of communities in our study are scaling that's compared to launching a brand new community or trying to revitalize an existing community um, this is pretty similar to our number last year and similar to last year this is showing us a, a maturing industry so an industry that's sort of beyond the point where mo the majority of companies are in their launching a community phase and they're moving into kind of scaling their community and looking to grow its role We tried to give a baseline for how big the average community is. There's no right or wrong number here, of course, but um, 1,000 to 10,000 was the most common option. This breakdown is fairly similar to last year, so we haven't seen a huge change in community size. This year over year trend in maturity is great and something that we're really happy to see. So. Last year, 18% of our com of communities in our study were less than a year old, and this year that number has gone down to 14%. Um, last year, 42% had existed for five or more years, and this year that number has gone up to 49%. So again, we're seeing uh, that year-over-year -year investment, um, comp proving that this isn't kind of a, a passing trend or a fad for companies that they're really committing into this for the long term.
Again, another sign, as David said, that companies are finding community valuable, probably one of the biggest signs is they're hiring more people. So they're really willing to put in that, that investment and put the money behind community teams. This year, 67% uh, of organizations in our study had at least two full-time people on their community team. And that's gone up from 50% in 57% in 2020. So that's a pretty big jump. And we're really happy to see that kind of additional headcount. And we'd really love to do additional research in the future on kind of, you know, as these teams expand, what does that like? What types of roles do companies hire? How are they structuring out that team? So I think there's a lot more that we can kind of dig into here. And again, we're seeing a lot of growth in that community manager role. So 88% of companies had at least one full-time dedicated community manager. Um, the last time we asked this exact question was in 2017 and yeah, just over 70% of companies said yes. Um, so there's that's a huge amount of growth in both that they're willing to dedicate the resources to those full-time roles and also that we're seeing a lot more people come into that community manager role, which is really great to see. To reiterate on this one, this is huge, right? Like we, when, when we started doing this research a long time ago, back in 2017, and even like the insights we found when we started CMX back in 2014, it was still just like a lot of companies were investing in community, but they would put an intern on it. They would just like, you know, staff it with someone really junior and as well so to see that even like this is a really interesting metric i think as a measure of investment in the industry it's just like at least having one dedicated full-time person responsible for community is is a huge step up from previous years so I, I was really pumped to see this and you know i think we'll continue to see this grow yeah and it's it's this is in the report as well but um we looked at how companies whose community was less than a year old answered this question and 79% uh, so almost 80% of those did have a dedicated community manager. So uh, I don't think we've looked at that question in the past, but it's a great data point that today even companies that are just launching their community realize that they need to kind of dedicate a full time role to managing it. Uh, this was a new question that we added this year. We asked about what department the community team reports into. Uh, so marketing is the most common answer. Customer success and support was common, but we were really happy to see that community, a dedicated community department was actually the third most popular answer. Um, and we'd be really curious to see how this kind of changes year over year. Um, and I'd also like to uh, plug David's clubhouse talk later today where he'll be discussing the role of chief community officer. So, you know, does having a dedicated community department help with getting community up to those executive, those C-suite roles? Um, how does that kind of affect the way that community is able to input on the broader company strategy um, are great questions for us to kind of continue to dig into. Yeah. Yeah, this, this one's super interesting to me and we've been having so many conversations um, with other community professionals recently on this topic. And, you know, I've kind of formed this opinion that uh, community needs to be its own department to really succeed. Uh, I tweeted the other day that until there's a C-level position in the company, community will always be biased by the department that it's living under. So if it's marketing, going to have to drive marketing goals and it's probably not going to be able to focus as much on product goals or success goals. And so I think this is going to be a really interesting metric to track year to year and to see how it develops to see if more companies are creating dedicated community departments because I think that's going to be a very strong representation that the industry is maturing and getting more buy-in and, and businesses are understanding community on a deeper level. So yeah, we're going to be joining on Clubhouse at 12 o'clock Pacific today. Um, the the links on, uh, we'll, we'll post a link here in the chat if you want to join that discussion as well. That's going to be really interesting. Uh, 
Um, great. So yeah, just emphasizing again, this finding that community is really becoming critical and essential for businesses that have it, a trend that we've seen develop over the last couple of years. And again, we're seeing companies affirm that this year. So yeah, 86% of companies in our study agreed that community is critical to their company's mission. That's a huge number. Um, we asked participants to agree or disagree with a series of statements. Um, we're gonna go through a few more of these, but this is kind of uh, by far the, the largest percentage of people that agreed. And this is, is really exciting for us to see. Um, so here's a couple other questions we asked, including uh, I have seen increased interest in my community from other departments and um, my company plans to invest in community more next year. Um, and for most of these statements compared to last year, the number of people that agree overall remained relatively consistent. Um, but what we saw compared to last year is that more people said that they strongly agree. So that agreement is, is strengthening. Um, people are feeling this to be kind of even more true or even something that um, they felt really solidify within their company over the last year. Um, and overall 69% said that their company plans to increase their investment in community next year. That's a great sign. And yeah, that's kind of why we're here today is if you're one of those people, how can we help you to, to make sure that you're kind of prepared to, to take advantage of that investment and run with that momentum forward? Um, are there any questions that we, that we want to uh, address here? Yes. Thank you, Mary. There are. Um, Ali actually wondered, so when we go, when we talk about the title community manager, um, did this also include any titles that were like 100% focused on community or is it more decision maker focused? Because sometimes like interns are in charge or um, contractors and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we asked what uh, people's titles were. We've got that breakdown in the beginning. Um, but 50% said we didn't ask about specific titles, but rather kind of the level that people were at. So 50% said they were at the manager level, 18% um, at a more junior level, 14% um, were directors, 8% were VPs, um, and 5% were in kind of the founder bucket. So it's heavily in the manager area, um, as well as about 20% of our respondents in that kind of senior decision making um, bucket. And in order to qualify for this survey, respondents um, had to respond that their job was either um, involved community management in some capacity. Um, it didn't have to be their full time job to allow for the fact that sometimes for some jobs, people do it alongside a series of other roles. Cool. And then Steve also asked um, about the data specifically for the communities that are employees. And I do think there was a slide that you actually had, like what, what kind of communities people are running. And I think it was 5% of the respondents are running employee communities. So that answers Steve's question. Yeah, we will look at that. Um, yeah, that number compared to other types of communities in our study was low and we'll, we'll get to this in an upcoming section, but um, yeah, that number tends to be relatively low every time we do this research. So, you know, does that seg suggest that that's an area that more companies kind of, that's a growth area for companies to hire a community manager for their communities of employees, or are we just kind of not um, attracting that participation and maybe that's, sort of its own specific study. I think that's that's a good question for us to dig into. Um, but yes, those are represented in here, but it's not a um, particularly high number compared to other communities. Yeah, and Steve followed up and said he was wondering if we could like dive into some of these data points specifically for internal communities. So uh, we'll get back to you on that. I think mm -hmm. we'll, we'll just need to make sure that it's statistically significant because if the numbers are too small, we don't want to give you insights that we don't believe are are statistically significant, but I think there are probably some good insights we can get from the data we have. So we'll follow up on that, Steve, and we'll probably publish an article on that later. Should we continue? I mean, we have a couple more questions. 
I, we could take another question. Cool. Let's save. I see someone asked about demographics. Let's save that because we will get into that near the end. Perfect. Um, but if there's any, anything else. Yeah, Gary just wonders if you can define what community investment is. Like, are we talking just money? Is it how do we define that investment? We intentionally uh, didn't define that to account. We, we just the, the wordings that you're going to see throughout here are the wordings that were given to our survey participants as well. Um, and we left that intentionally kind of open ended to account for the fact that at some companies that might be um, money, resources, a budget, and at other, in other cases, it might just be increased headcount. It might even be, you know, maybe uh, increased education for the teams or increased education within the company. Like, I think that could be taken in a lot of different ways. David, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that. Maybe a good call out for us to like specify that in future research um, and, and split out that data to find specifically investing. But mm -hmm. to Mary's point, mm -hmm. we're really looking in total investment in this report. All right, I think we should continue on. Great. <laughs> All right, so again, yeah, one of my favorite findings out of this report is the kind of COVID specific section. So obviously this is something that we didn't ask about in prior years, but it was something, it was again, that kind of storyline that, you know, people were saying their community had become kind of big, a bigger buzzword or more interesting to their company during COVID. Um, we really wanted to find out if that was true. And so, yeah, it's very cool to see that in a year when a lot of businesses had to make really tough decisions um, around pivots or downsizing in our data, we didn't really see a majority of community programs experience cuts. Um, we actually saw that a majority of them continued to receive investment from their company or even saw more investment and more interest. More than half of community teams said that they were viewed as more essential during COVID. Um, and again, this kind of reinforces that idea that, you know, not just a passing trend, but that companies are really finding value from community, um, even when they're under this kind of incredible pressure, um, communities not being put on the shopping block. And in a lot of cases, um, companies actually were leaning on their community to help them through these times. Again, this is something that we kind of heard anecdotally throughout the year. We heard it, um, again, these anonymous responses are pulled from the write-in responses to our survey. So something we heard from our responses and we'll see in our data as well, um, that communities were extremely well positioned to help companies connect to their customers or their stakeholders um, in a year when that kind of became even more important and a lot of other avenues to do this were shut down. So that's definitely a factor we think in why some communities were kind of seeing this increased interest throughout the year. Um, so yeah, 80% saw kind of the same level or more investment. Um, a third of communities said they saw more investment and just 20% reported that um, investment in their community decreased. And again, this was, this was left open-ended. So investment in sort of whatever context that looks like within their company. We saw a similar trend in team sizes. Um, there's obviously gonna be some change fluctuations in team size at companies that happens every year, but we were really curious if there would be kind of a noticeable change this year um, due to just generally more companies having layoffs and having to downsize. Um, and we were happy to see that just 15% said that their team size decreased. So we're not seeing, again, that kind of massive drop off or a significant amount of cuts across the industry. Um, what does all of this mean for communities? Um, we asked Brian Oblinger that question and here's his advice. Um, yes, communities are kind of continuing to see this momentum and this buy-in accelerate during COVID. Um, but you know, there's always going to be ups and downs in business. A community may is in the spotlight. Right now, it may not be forever. Um, so yeah, his advice is if you're kind of seeing this level of increased interest at your company during COVID um, to not wait and to really start 
advocating, um, educating within your company now to cement community's place in your organization. I just want to um, jump into on that last slide on like how teams were affected in COVID because I think this was a really interesting thing that we witnessed this year where another narrative that's been popular in the community and it's true years is that like when a company has layoffs community is one of the first things to get cut um because it's not like core to growth or the business model and you know community professionals were somewhat indispensable and in a year where layoffs were happening left and right um community teams not being affected or even actually growing more than decreasing is like I was blown away by that, right? Like what a change of course from where we've been in the last 10 years. Uh, pretty unbelievable to see that. And and anecdotally, I spoke with, with a few companies personally and like their heads of community. And these are like billion dollar unicorn companies with huge head counts um, and pretty large community teams that like you could have easily, you know, cut, 50% of that community team and still have a lot and still have a bigger community team than most other companies. And, and they told me that zero people from the community teams were cut like marketing sales product, like everything else had all these, like the companies cut 25% of staff community was untouched. So it just, again, really speaks to community is becoming more irreplaceable, more built into business models and something that companies don't see as dispensable. And that that's, that's huge. Um, so that kind of brings us to the end of the community growth and great news stats. And now we're going to pivot a bit and talk about, you know, it's not all smooth sailing. It's not all perfect. Um, there, people still experience frustrations, challenges, and yeah, we're seeing some of these, the fundamental challenges that we've been tracking since CMX was founded, um, including, but not, um, not exclusively measuring value, um, are still frustrations within the industry today. So in this section, um, we're going to look a bit more at this question specifically, how are communities actually measuring their value, how are they tracking that, and, and demonstrating it. So this was a list of common frustrations. Respondents were allowed to select more than one. Um, and yeah, measuring value this year shot right to the top. This has been in the top three frustrations since we started doing this survey. 45% um, say it's one of their top frustrations. That's pretty similar to last year. Um, I think it maybe went down by, by 1%. So this is something that's still remaining a challenge year over year. Um, it's interesting to highlight in last year's study, engaging members was the top frustration. That was a lot higher. So it's possible that um, that was a bit easier this year when everyone is kind of online all the time, or that's just something that, you know, people have kind of found ways to improve on. But uh, that one did kind of notably go down this year. Yeah, I think th this one's been interesting to watch year over year. Those two kind of like always kind of like take the two top spots. It's like quantifying value and engaging members. Like those, those are consistently the challenges. So, you know, that's been really interesting for us at CMX and like thinking about how do we continue to support community professionals? Like it's clear that just like as much as companies are interested in community, there's still this challenge of, of, of quantifying the value and measuring it. You know, Jeff just posted in the chat, really understanding cost of acquisition, uh, customer acquisition and, and understanding like how community impacts that it, like we're getting better at that but as as mary is about to show like we're still really struggling to measure it um and one last thing i want to call out um which is the uh, the third one our, our efforts are largely manual and not automated it's kind of like always sitting around there in the third spot and we don't always talk about it but i think it's worth calling out because it's still a huge challenge that a lot of com community teams are struggling with and it, it's, it, to me, it speaks to like community professionals are, they, we talk about like they have to start very hands-on and like building relationships and engagement. 
but they're still finding it really challenging to offload that over time to scale up their efforts to distribute control to the community or to have tools and tech that helps them automate their processes or or you know systematize the work they're doing so i think there's a lot of opportunity for all of you <coughs> building community out there to um, recognize that this is a challenge that you, you're either going to face or maybe you are facing now. And it's something that can really help you become more efficient is think about like, what are the things that are very, very manual processes that you're doing now that can either be handed off to others and delegated to uh, be distributed to community members, or uh, you can find tools that will help you automate it so you can do, you can build community at scale and not feel like all your work is, is manual. Um, and in the report, we did split out as well um, what are the top values for the top frustrations for people sort of just entering the industry versus those who've been in the industry for a long time. And among those who have been in the industry for, you know, the very top end, so nine or more years, um, that is one that fell off. Um, the automation piece um, was no longer a top frustration and headcount and staff moved all the way up to the top. So seeing how those change over um, the course of experience is interesting as well. Um, we asked our participants how confident they were in their ability to quantify their community's value. Um, just 12%, and that's the wording that was used in the question was confidence. So just 12% said that they could confidently quantify um, the value of their community. Another 61% uh, said that this was a work in process for them, which is great. But um, this confident number is, is definitely one that we'd like to see continue to rise. Um, next, in this next section, we'll dig a bit more into the most popular objectives for community programs and some of the most popular metrics they're using to track against that. Um, throughout this, we'll be using the spaces model to talk about community objectives. Um, these definitions were given to our survey participants as well. Um, and if you're familiar with this model, um, we've actually updated it this year, which I'll talk a bit about, but you can kind of check out the new details of this model on the blog. Um, if we have just a quick moment, uh, Chris oh. asked in regards to this model, can you provide a little bit more context between the difference um, between contribution and engagement? Because they definitely feel kind of interconnected. Yeah, I could speak to that. Um, and, and like, you know, some of these, there isn't going to be a perfectly clear line, but they exist distinctly because there are teams that focus um, more clearly on one than the other, and, and they are distinct programs uh, in, in a lot of cases. So contribution is where your, your company, your product is a platform that relies on the community to be contributing the content and or it could be like code if it's open source or like a developer platform if you're a nonprofit, it could be like votes or actions or donations um if it's you know uh, crypto then that's all built by the community if it's collaborative consumption it's you know airbnbs or social networks like facebook the content on the platform is being created by the community and so the community team's job is to make that 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 the content contributors more successful, right? Like Twitch is another example or Clubhouse, right? Like it's all creator driven. Engagement is uh, specifically around retention. So it could just be customers, people who buy your product and you're trying to build a community, uh, usually like an interest-based community for those customers with the hopes that by, uh, giving them a sense of community and belonging and engaging them through it. They're going to stick around longer as a customer. Customer lifetime value is going to go up. We're going to share some of those metrics um, in a minute. But like Sephora is a good example of that, right? They have the Beauty Talk Forum and they find that their, uh, their active users on the forum spend two times more than their average customer and their power users on the forum spend 10 times more than their average customer. So it's an example of engagement where building community is increasing the value and retention of a customer. Uh, any other questions on the spaces objectives? 
we'll I'll kind of refer to these throughout this section. So. Just linked to an article that actually goes through examples and data points and lays out the spaces model um, in more depth in the chat. So you can check it out there. So this year we asked both what is uh, what are all of the objectives on this list that you work towards as well as as well as um, what is the single top objective, the primary objective for the community that you work in. Um, this is the first year that we split support out, sorry, success out on its own separately from support. Um, customer support continues to be a top objective. I think that's been true since we started this research. Um, and engagement is very popular as well, both as an overall objective and a top objective. Um, it's really interesting to see success already land in the top three. Um, so a lot of what we're seeing here is, is the difference there is really that you're moving from um, just answering questions and troubleshooting towards actively engaging customers to use the product more or to use it better. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing there is communities that have kind of built a customer support community in the past that are now evolving onto success and being able to have a stronger and a more clear impact on other metrics um, such as customer lifetime value or customer retention. Um, again, yeah, you can see internal engagement. That's typically communities of employees. Um, again, yeah, that's a relatively low number, and um, that's been true since we started our survey. I think that because of the shift to remote work, that conversation is, is likely to change, and that's likely to become more important and more interesting to companies over time, especially if um, it remains true that a lot of companies keep the ability to work remote even after the pandemic is over. One thing I'll call out here is I like, I'm, I was a little surprised to find acquisitions still be this low this year. So it's interesting to see that a lot of community teams aren't um, aren't focusing on it as much because like anecdotally and when I'm talking to teams and when I'm talking to a lot of startups and founders, this is like a large part of the narrative that's happening in the space right now where, you know, we've had support forums for a very long time. Um, and there's, you know, clear value there, uh, reducing support costs and, and, um, retaining those customers through support. Um, but I, I, you know, when you see the real excitement around community today and what people are talking about, it's around community as a growth engine, community to help you attract new customers, to kind of drive pipeline. You know, they're like, I've seen like, there's this chat on Clubhouse happening weekly now called community led growth. There's like over a thousand people in those chats. Um, and the whole conversation is around how community is like the new way of growing a company. So I expect this number to continue to go up. And for the community, for all of you building community, like thinking about how community can drive growth and acquisition, like at the end of the day, that's what companies care about most. Like, cool if you could reduce costs, but if you can actually bring in new customers, new users, new members, that's like, that's where you're going to really scale up buy-in and budget and and, and there's amazing opportunity for community to drive that. So just want to call that out. I'll just read out here what Paul wrote, because um, I think it, he makes a good point. He loves it. We're measuring success separately. Traditional client success models have struggled to create a motion that significantly impacts retention because of the book of business allocation. So community solves this um, and it makes a lot of sense. Cool, thank you. Um, all right, so here's the list of the 10 most popular metrics that community managers use. Um, I'm curious to know if this list resonates. Do you use these? Um, do you guys use different metrics? Um, this was, again, select all that apply off of a fairly long list of metrics. There's kind of a long tail here that didn't make it into the top 10. Um, but one thing that stood out to both David and I looking at this report is that a lot of what ends up in the most popular metrics are um, metrics that really tell you about community health and community engagement. So active users, conversation engagement, um, even things like website traffic, whereas the metrics that are more connected to kind of this tangible business outcomes. So 
revenue, customer lifetime value, um, customer retention and acquisition or pipeline, um, those tend to show up lower on this list. Um, and it's important to track both, of course. Um, if you don't have community health and engagement, you don't really have a community that's able to achieve anything, but um, those are not, those metrics don't always communicate, especially within a company, um, what, what is the value that the community provides for the business. Um, which brings us to this next point. There's uh, somewhat of a gap, a, a slight gap between um, what leadership cares about and what they hope that community will provide for their business and what community measure, managers are measuring and sharing. Um, this is another area where I think we're seeing kind of some frustration about being able to get these two teams both on the same page, um, especially as more companies become interested in community, they add community, um, not, I think there's, people are finding there's often still an educational process that needs to happen and an alignment that needs to happen. Um, and to our previous conversation, because community often is falls within another department or it doesn't always have presence at the VP level or the executive level, getting that level of buy-in and alignment can be really challenging. Um, so even though companies may understand at a, at a very high level the value community provides, um, that doesn't always translate into them actually understanding the value of the specific community within their company. Um, here's sort of what that gap looks like. Um, on the left are the top, the most popular metrics that community managers measure. Again, many people manage uh, or track kind of a combination of many different metrics. And on the right, um, we asked community managers what metrics their company's leadership cares about. And the top metrics here, as you can see, do tend to be more closely related to those business outcomes. Um, so this is kind of an important takeaway for communicating those that value to leadership. Um, and David, I don't know if there's anything you would wanna add here. I mean, I, I think it's just interesting to note that this isn't um, this isn't the community leadership saying, these are the metrics we care about. This is community managers saying, this is what we think community leadership cares about. So it's not like community managers don't know what leadership cares about, they know. And, and like, this just like kind of clearly displays a little bit of that disconnect between like what we care about as community teams and what we know leadership cares about. Um, and to, to, to Mary's point, like we need to measure both. We need to speak to both. Um, but just acknowledging that like for us to get buy-in and continue to grow, these are the things we know that our leadership cares about. Um, we also asked how often people are sharing metrics with their company leadership. Um, monthly was the most common option and nearly 60% said they were sharing at least monthly. Um, there's been some great discussions in the CMX community in Slack lately about, you know, what does this, what do these presentations actually look like? How are other people doing it? Um, so yeah, we hope to kind of see more of those conversations and be able to share more best practices in this area. Um, any other, any questions on kind of metrics, value, tracking? We're gonna go into platforms next. Um, well, Rosemary just said, similar to what we were talking about before, you know, there's this really, the biggest challenge is to kind of get access to the data and to that offer operational side of things when you aren't a data scientist or like a strategy mm -hmm. operations expert. So that's one of the struggles is like trying to get that additional mm -hmm. support for someone to be a, you know, community strategist or something like that. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the challenge that community teams need to be thinking about and investing in is like, how do we build relationships? cross-functionally with other teams like maybe marketing has a data scientist that like you can collaborate with and you know the most successful community professionals i know spend a good amount of time 
getting in a room with other stakeholders in the company, like talking to the product team, talking to the marketing team, talking to support and success and learning like, what are your goals? What are the things that you want to accomplish? What systems do you use right now in order to track your success? Because then you can plug community into those existing systems, right? Like for CMX and Bevy, you know, we understand what the Bevy sales team, what systems and tools they use to track like what's actually driving sales. And so if we want CMX to have any sort of attribution to people who end up, you know, learning about Bevy or choosing, we want to make sure that community is a touch point in that sales journey. And that means we have to plug into Salesforce and for marketing, we have to plug into Marketo. And it turns out like they have a team and, and, and like a setup to be able to do those things that you can tap into and work with. You don't need community to have necessarily its own kind of data science resources or tools because like community is actually driving value to all these other systems. So just something to think about. Call uh, out to, um, I don't think we have it in this deck, but if you go into the research report, um, there's a really, really sweet table that breaks down the top three metrics for each area of the spaces model. So if you're investing in, uh, that's not in the deck, right? Mary, I'm not covering something. No, we're gonna no cover. it's not. Yeah, so go download the report. And so you could see for support, for product acquisition, engagement and success, what the top three metrics are that community teams measure for each of those. So you can really apply the right metrics to the kind of program that you're running. And it's very different actually from program to program, which is interesting. Um, okay, and it's not in this deck either, but we, we break that list down for platforms as well. Um, so yeah, platforms, everyone's favorite topic. So um, probably not surprisingly, there is a lot of room for improvement in tools and platforms used to manage communities, um, despite a year where there was certainly a lot of innovation and there's uh, more, probably more players on the market than ever. Um, yeah, so again, the, the issues and the frustrations that we're seeing, I, I think it's probably fair to say this, not for a lack of choices, maybe it's a maybe it's a problem of too many choices. But um, there were more than a hundred different write-ins this year for other. Um, there were you can see uh, how many people use some of those the most popular platforms. But there was certain people are certainly using a huge list of tools and platforms to manage communities. Um, and there were responses that that were brand new in our list last year that didn't appear this year. Um, we did not break out. You can kind of see here the popularity of um, social platforms compared to some of those dedicated platforms. Um, we didn't break those out specifically. This was also a select all that apply because I think many people are kind of um, managing those in tandem. Um, but yeah, that's definitely uh, an area that we'd like to dig into more. Um, is and that will probably be our next research topic is the is uh, community tools and platforms. When it comes to satisfaction, just 39% are very satisfied, are at least very satisfied, and 42% uh, are somewhat satisfied, which is sort of that okay, but could be better. Um, so there's clearly room for improvement here. There's a lot of opportunity for platforms. Um, one question that we've actually already gotten some great feedback from the CMX community that we didn't include is um, asking people why they don't like their platform. That wasn't something we really dug into here, but um, it is something we'd like to dig into more in the future. So yeah, if this is a topic that interests you, please let me know and I'd love to chat with you about it. Um, this year we also went through some of the biggest trends of 2020. We were really curious how this shift to virtual events affected communities and how um, losing the ability to gather in person um, affected the way that, that affected community health and engagement and um, the way that people gathered. 
Oh, I see there's a question about platform satisfaction. Um, I'll jump back quickly. Um, we can look at that and, and I'll see if that's something we can pull out. The, the problem is just, as you can see, the numbers of people who use each platform start to get small pretty quickly. So it's not a lot of data to work off, but um, we could look at that maybe at least for the top, um, the top 10 or so in this list and we could see what that looks like. Is that answering Catherine's question? Yes. Okay. The question was, do we know which platforms are the ones that people are most satisfied with? Um, for those of you who don't see the question. Um, okay. <laughs> so yeah, again, yeah, we were curious how that, that loss of in-person gathering has affected communities. Um, and yes, people did experience a lot of challenges in making this switch and had to pivot their strategy last minute. Um, but we also found that community managers actually found a lot of value in these virtual events that they were sort of forced to learn and adapt to. And um, I think there's kind of some surprising findings through here. Um, we're seeing signals throughout these responses that, you know, even when in, in person, I, I hate to say if and when, I hope it's a when in person re events resume safely, um, communities think they will continue to make virtual events part of their strategy. Um, so some of the reasons that people gave throughout here include um, accessibility, the ability to kind of meet with people online regardless of their geographic location, a lower cost for events, no need to travel, um, and a couple other things as well. We asked um, whether the community itself had been positively or negatively impacted by the shift to virtual events. Um, for these questions, uh, we only asked these to people that told us that they did used to host in-person events, but they shifted to virtual. Um, so just under half said their community was positively impacted. 27% um, said it had a negative impact. So um, overall, we're, we're definitely seeing some value here being unlocked through virtual, although that's not necessarily the case across the board. Yeah, I mean, this was surprising to me. I would have thought it would be more negative because just kind of like the, the conversations everyone has is like, ugh, you know, like, the COVID has really like ruined our community, you know, even CMX, it's like, we couldn't have CMX summit. Like we're really missing something, but you know, I think this was interesting because it's just like, yes, we lost a lot by not being able to gather in person, but it also caused us to like be really creative and come up with new solutions and brought this whole virtual event component into our strategies that didn't exist before. Um, but to actually see that 49% said it had a positive impact. I was like, Oh yeah, cool. Surprising. Um, related to that question, we asked about what the events landscape will look like when in-person events resume safely. Um, and again, to make sure this was kind of a fair assessment, we only asked um, people that used to hold in-person events. More than half said so they plan to offer the same number or more virtual events. Um, and 65% actually want to try hybrid events, which is very cool and very cutting edge of the community industry. Um, so yeah, I mean, the takeaway, uh, one takeaway from all of this, I think, is that community events strategies may look very different in the future. Um, in a lot of conversations we've had, you know, it's no longer a binary choice between having an in-person events program versus an online community. Um, this year, a lot of people saw that distinction sort of erase um, and they just moved to manage that all as one community. Um, we also saw people, you know, again, sort of being forced to experiment with different ways to bring people together, different combinations of large scale on virtual, small scale in person. There's gonna be a lot more flexibility, we think. Um, next year and going forward um, and people will really, you know, be able to use some creativity in putting together an events program that really meets the objectives that they want for their community. Um, finally, we did ask about virtual platforms. Um, Zoom was far and away number one, everyone's using Zoom. But again, there's a huge volume of write-ins and you can see that other percentage is really big as well. 
Um, so again, here, a lot of different platforms and a lot of different options, and we'll be doing some work sort of highlighting some of these in the future. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see what actually happens in reality, because I feel like there's a lot of speculation around hybrid events and what, what that's going to look like in the future now. Um, I, I've run a hybrid conference before, not not even CMX Summit. My first, one of my first community jobs was running community for Le Web, which was the largest tech conference in Europe. We had, I think, over like 5,000, 10,000 people um, live in person. And then we had like a very high quality live stream online and, and it, it was a full on hybrid event and it is very expensive. It is ex like a ton of work. You're basically like hosting two events simultaneously to keep everyone engaged virtually and in person at the same time. It's, it's, it's a challenge. So, you know, I think the idea of a hybrid event is really compelling in practice. It'll be very interesting to see how many people are just like, actually like the in-person is actually what we really want to do and they'll just switch back. Um, but I do think that dedicated virtual events are here to stay because they're like, we've just learned from this last year how scalable they are. Um, they're like affordable, uh, they're accessible. You, you can have a lot more people participate. You can do them more often. You can um, launch them more quickly. There's like less ramp up time. Um, and so I think what hybrid will mean is like a lot of companies will be hosting virtual events and they'll be hosting in-person events. The extent to which a single event is gonna be both virtual and in-person, I think is maybe a little bit um, overestimated. Cool, thank you, David. Um, yeah, so this is our final section. Um, we asked about diversity, equity, and inclusion in communities. Um, this is a topic we're really committed to at CMX, so making sure we're not just building a future for the community industry, but making sure that that future is inclusive and equitable, and that's something that we're all able to work towards. Um, and then following last year, last summer's Black Lives Matter protests and the sort of huge volume of conversations that were happening around this topic, um, we really wanted to spend some time digging into this in our survey. So we have, we have good news on this topic and um, we think we've also kind of identified some areas where there's more work that can be done. So yeah, this is the first year in our study that we asked participants to disclose their racial or ethnic identity. Um, we'd like to do more work sort of digging into what this looks like um, in specific regions for specific role types. Um, and some of that, that sort of helps to contextualize these numbers a bit. Um, but for this report, we, we did really want to kind of get, get a number and baseline this across the industry and across the CMX community as well. I mean, like this, I'm, I was excited that we were collecting this data because like we just need to start having benchmarks and understand where the industry is today. Um, and like we want to do more digging into this. We're going to be publishing follow up research into like how does this compare to other industries in tech? Um, how does this compare into the actual distributions of, of race and ethnicity in, in different countries um, to see like, you know, where, where do we need to improve? I think it's you look at this graph, you know, like obviously there's there's going to be a ton of room for improvement and you know we know that the numbers are even higher in america and europe it's like over 70 percent of community professionals identify as white um and so a lot of work for us to do as an industry to make sure that we are um empowering underserved groups and underrepresented groups to enter this industry to grow in this industry um, we want to dive into like seniority level based on race and ethnicity and like make sure that, you know, we're identifying what those numbers are so that we can hold ourselves accountable as an industry. Um, we asked overall community professionals, do you believe your organization should be taking a public stance on issues, any issues related to diversity, equity and inclusion? 79% um, said yes, so many people are committed to, you know, having this conversation and want to see their companies um, active in that conversation. Um, following up on that, we asked respondents if their communities 
took any kind of stance or made a statement during last summer's Black Lives Matter protests and just under half did. So there, there's still a conversation there about you know, how these issues actually play out in communities, how community managers are actually addressing these within their communities um, and, and what that looks like. And as a follow-up to that, we also asked participants if they had a specific policy related to diversity, equity, and inclusion for managing their community and managing conversation and engagement within their community. Um, just over half did of those who did not have such a policy. Um, one third said that they were planning to create one in the future. Um, this is another area where we'd really like to see those numbers go up. Um, we'd like to see people committing to kind of managing diversity and inclusion in their communities in a more active and a more proactive way. Um, related to this, um, I'm excited to announce that we've just finalized a workshop later this month with Ashley Brookshaw that will be dedicated exclusively to creating these equitable experiences in an online community. Um, Ashley's an expert in online community engagement, change management, um, DEI, and also driving business results as well. So this we think will be a great and a really useful workshop. And we'd love to get to, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Lena wonders, do we have any specific examples of these policies? Like what does this question mean? Yeah, I think that's an area where I'd really like to dive in more about how, you know, what these policies look like in communities, how people put them together. Um, I do think that's that's definitely an area where, you know, we'd love to talk to some people who have done this in the past, people who help other communities to do this, to, to give people who, who do want to kind of take more action in this area guidance on how they can do that um, and, and what that examples of what that looks like as well. Um, so if you have resources on this topic, if you have an experience within your community, um, we'd love to help you share that. So please feel free to get in touch. Um, David, anything else on this topic? Um, I think the other stat that we included in the report that we didn't share here is just how many people actually took a stance on Black Lives Matter when when the when the protests were happening this year. Um, and so that was an interesting topic in the community during the protests. I remember in our Facebook group and in Slack, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, do we take a stance? Do we stay out of it because it's, you know, quote unquote political? Is it political or is it a human rights issue? So this kind of like, you know, should our companies take a stance? And then like, should we as a community team take a stance within our community? And just like, like the bare minimum of like making a statement that we support Black Lives Matter and our Black members. Um, and we actually saw there's like a pretty big disconnect between, um, you know, the, the data on like thinking that com companies should take a stance on DEI and how many community professionals actually did take a stance within their communities and made a statement. Um, so it's just an interesting uh, gap there. And I think a conversation we need to keep having about like, what's our responsibility as community leaders um, that are running these spaces to um, take a stance on human rights issues when they come up. Um, Great, so that brings us to the end of our findings. I think we've we've covered throughout some, some of the next steps that we're hoping to see uh, people take following this study um, and even ways to kind of use some of the data throughout here. So recapping those, we've talked about um, ways to sort of align community vision with uh, company leadership, ways to, to make sure you're tracking business outcomes and things that really speak to um, the bottom line for business. Um, you know, taking advantage of some of those creative event types and setting really informed goals for events programs, um, as well as building these inclusive spaces and managing that um, diversity and equity more actively within a community. Uh, David, any final, final thoughts on What's next? 
you know, I think, you know, we, like we said, we identified some big gaps in, in areas that we want to continue to improve. Um, and we're going to continue to do a lot more research in this space throughout the year. Mary has a long list of research reports and projects that we, we want to get to in, in 2021. Um, and so we want to keep hearing from you, like, what is the data that you're looking for? What are the reports that you want to see us create? And, and like really dive into, like use us as a resource to kind of get the insights that you know will help you be better at your job and get more buy-in. Um, we're gonna be developing uh, more in-depth education programs around getting buy-in. You know, we have the community MBA and we're gonna be fleshing that out into, into more education. Um, so like, I mean, just like what an exciting time for our industry and for our profession. For those of you who have been in the CMX community for a long time and been working in this space for as long as I have, like, you know, this is what we fought for for 10 years for like this level of buy in and this level of awareness and investment. And, you know, to the quote from Brian Oblinger that Mary shared earlier, like, this is our moment to cement our role in business, to really uh, to be able to back it up with data and actual metrics. Like, great, everyone's bought in and interested. How do we make sure that they stay interested and they continue to invest when, you know, there's a next new hot kind of business trend? This is our moment, so let's take advantage of it. Any other questions? Great. Well, I, I can hand it back to our MC, Anne-Marie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Mary, David, Beth. That was super informative. Um, now it is time to move on to some breakout sessions. So how you navigate there, at the top of the screen, there is agenda. Just click on that. We'll have two rooms. Um, they're listed accordingly. You can join Mary and Beth or David and myself. Let's dive into some more findings. We'll just have an open discussion. If you do want to get on screen, simply just um, note that in the chat and we will give you access. All right. I'll hang here for a second, but um, please join the rooms that you'd like to participate in and we'll see you back here soon. <laughs>